In the early 1990s, I was studying my master's in artificial intelligence, or AI. We were looking at backpropagation planners, an AI technique for finding a sequence of logical actions a robot could take to meet a goal. For example, to find three blocks of three different colors and stack them on each other in a certain order. As part of this, I implemented a backpropagation planner in Prolog. It worked, but I was shocked at just how long execution took. Yay, Prolog! And how many different failures it encountered during the search. It didn't feel like a heuristics. In fact, it felt like an exhaustive enumeration of the problem space, visiting some of the states in that space many, many times. Out of curiosity, I wrote a different, much simpler program. Instead of logically planning, this one tried random sequences of operations. No tricky heuristics, no prioritization, just plain old randomness. The result? It outperformed the intentional model handily. Ever since then, random selection is my favorite way to evaluate any heuristic. Hi, I'm John Miller, the deliberate engineer. I spent 30 years working in big tech, including 15 as a principal engineer. I've helped design, implement, and test many complex distributed systems. Examples include credential and routing caches, allocation and placement algorithms for memory and virtual machines, steam network optimization, in other words, what's the best pipe to put where, and many more. This isn't random, useless software. Much of it took many years to make, and some of it ran on literally hundreds of millions of different computers. You'd be surprised how often you start design thinking you know your problem space. Then you find that writing heuristics exploiting that knowledge leads you to do exactly the wrong thing. I can think of three reasons this happens. First, misunderstanding the data and heuristics. You have incorrect assumptions about the way your system is used and how your heuristics actually work. Two, confirmation bias. You understand a small part of your system, but you treat it like the majority because you remember observations that support your assumption. You heavily bias your algorithm and measure to match that understanding, prioritizing the wrong cases. Third, complex heuristic interaction. You apply a series of heuristics which may be individually correct, but they're collectively wrong. And then finally, an honorable mention, wrong optimization metric. Whether your system is right or wrong, you're measuring impact the wrong way. Implementing a simple random algorithm can provide a baseline to identify poor system behavior in these four cases. It gives you something to compare against, so you know if your heuristics and algorithm help or hurt the problem you're trying to solve. A random baseline of your system is a great place to start implementation. The random part is cheap to build. The plumbing around it, like error handling and retry logic, things like that, you have to build anyways. So it costs you very little to make them for this random baseline. Best of all, if the random baseline works well enough, you can ship it. This lets you accumulate more real data on performance and system behavior before deciding when and how to optimize the system that you're working on. Let me give you a couple examples from my previous work. If you're not interested in these, go ahead and skip forward to the summary. The first example is from distributed hash tables, or DHTs. In case you're not familiar with DHTs, think of them as a hash table that's so large it takes thousands or millions of computers to store it and make it work. I worked on a few of these over the years, but the one that I always think of is the Peer Name Resolution Protocol, PNRP. PNRP relies on having an exponential or prefix-based routing cache to help find nodes based on their unique ID. For our example, let's pretend the ID is a seven digit phone number. Each node has a unique cache with seven rows, one for each digit. We'll call these rows zero through six, since this is a computer science problem. Each row of the cache has nine entries, one less than the number of values for a single digit. Each row of a node's routing table has entries of nodes whose IDs share a prefix with that node. So let's say your node ID is 8675309. In row zero, entries share a zero length prefix with your ID. In other words, no common digits. The phone number begins with any digit other than eight. In row one, every node ID that you cache begins with the same first digit as yours, eight. The second digit for all those entries is different than your your second digit. So it'll be 80, 81, 82, and so on up through 89. This special structure ensures that when you receive a message to forward, it matches part of your prefix and you can get at least one digit closer to the target ID. In other words, it requires the log base 10 of the number of nodes in the system hops to reach any destination. If every seven digit ID is used, then there's 10 million nodes in the system and it takes log base 10 of 10 million, or seven, hops to reach the target. We spent a long time working on PNRP and it mostly worked as designed. As we debugged, I got curious. Did we really need and benefit from all these heuristics? Did we need so many complex procedures to warm, maintain, and shape our routing cache? What about within a row? Rather than keeping slots specifically for an ID that matched the next digit that you were looking for, one, two, three, could you get away with just randomly replacing any entry in the row? What about the whole cache? 
If you let it be a little larger, could you get away with just randomly replacing any entry in the cache rather than worrying about rows and columns and still get good performance? The answer is random cache replacement policy wasn't as good as our complex strategy. More surprisingly, however, it wasn't far off and it was more robust than other ways. If we'd tried it before all of the engineering work that we put into creating the cache structure, it could have saved a lot of time and a lot of money. A second example is about job scheduling, similar to Kubernetes and other job schedulers used to assign computing tasks to run on particular cloud servers. Suppose you have a cloud service that runs jobs or tasks on behalf of customers. The jobs vary wildly. One job might require a single instance on a single server. Another might require thousands of copies to run a distributed simulation. One needs a megabyte of RAM. Another one needs 100 gigabytes. One idles the CPU, while another will consume as many CPUs as are locally available. A job might run for a minute, or it could run for a year. And then there's the host the cloud company maintains to run these jobs for the customers. Some of these hosts are cheap, some are expensive, some are old, some are new. When I worked on scheduling, our goal, like most other teams in the space, was to create a job assignment scheme that required the smallest number of physical servers to satisfy everyone's needs, while still providing good quality of service. Depending on how you implement the scheduling service, you can wind up needing several times as many servers and server resources than the customers are actually using at any moment. That costs a lot of money and it hurts the business. One approach to creating the scheduler is to have a bunch of clever software engineers implement a very fast, flexible, constraint satisfaction engine. Maybe it optimizes for the number of servers used. Maybe it optimizes for trying to keep the greatest flexibility for handling future requests. And there's a million other possibilities. Some of the challenges that I've seen working on a job scheduling or cloud compute service layer include, one, the space is incredibly complex. For example, with 50 multi-valued optimization and packing parameters, each parameter might make sense on its own, but when you combine a bunch of these together, does the system really honor any of them? Is the blend right? Does it work at all? Two, as you engineer such a system, you tend to verify your code and behavior with simple examples you can understand and explain to other people. You verify that these work the way you expect, but does that mean the system will work overall? Who knows? Finally, sometimes you're optimizing for a well-discussed, well-agreed-on metric that winds up not being the one that matters. For example, suppose that you optimize for how long it takes your system to respond to a placement request. You might be making awful placement decisions in the name of speed, wasting hardware. Or let's say that you're optimizing for the percent of average success for placing jobs by count when really 95% of your revenue and your reputation comes from just 5% of your placement decisions. And it turns out that those are the ones that are suffering to get good overall numbers. You're paying customers leave because they're getting lousy service, despite the free customers being very happy and very impressed. You can make an argument that placement decisions should be random rather than prioritized by complex, opaque, and possibly wrong heuristics. If the job fits on a randomly selected node, that's great. If not, retry a different random node. Would such a decision be a good one? Would the system have better emergent behavior? I honestly don't know, but I think it's a very interesting question. Summing things up, if you're designing any sort of complex heuristic system, it's worth the time and the cost of implementing a version that uses random choice rather than complex algorithms. This simple system provides you with a baseline that can add perspective to evaluating the complex systems you go on to replace it with. I assure you there's a lot of production systems out there using heuristics today which perform worse than random selection would. I probably wrote some of them. So, do you agree or disagree with this idea of random choice being a good part of system design and evaluation? Have you got some examples that you could share without being sued into oblivion? I'd love to hear about them, as I'm sure other folks would. Thanks for watching, and keep on pushing forward. Hi, this is John. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing so you get notified of my future videos. Also, if you are interested, you might want to check out the video I have linked here. Thanks, and keep on pushing forward.